Um, so we've been told that we have 20 minutes uh, this morning to share the highlights of the Heart of the Press report published yesterday by QQI. Um, I've been told strictly that I'm going to get a yellow card at three minutes and a red card. I don't follow soccer, but I will <laughs> attempt to obey. Um, so Deidre and myself produced the report that was published yesterday, but we were ab very ably assisted in the analysis that informed the report by a full project team. So I just want to point to Dr. Annie Duna, who will be chairing the panel discussion this afternoon, to Alexandra Anton Ahern, and to Matthew Hurley, who are not up here sharing the microphone, but uh, were contributors to the report. Um, as Corrick has indicated, the analysis this morning was based on the 2021-2022 academic year, so we're going back in time a little. For those of you who are well and truly sick of talking about AI, there will be no chat GPT for the next 10, 20 minutes, okay? Um, so I'm going to hand over to Deirdre now, who's going to tell you a little bit about the structure of the report, and I'm going to try very hard not to push her off the podium today. Okay, very good. Thanks, Kathy, and good morning, everybody. So look, I'm aware that many of you in the room are already very familiar with the AQR process. You may have led your own uh, institutional uh, work to submit an AQR, but I'm also aware that there are others in the room who may have had less direct engagement um, with the AQR process or with the thematic analyses reports um, that are produced annually on foot of the, the, those AQRs. So just to give you a very quick refresher about what the thematic analysis is, it synthesizes the developments in QA policy, QA procedures, strategy, and so on, that are reported on by institutions in the AQR that they submit. And then it highlights trends and themes arising from those AQR reports. So for the 2021-2022 academic year, so that's what we're looking at here, AQRs were submitted by current and apparent awarding bodies uh, in the Irish higher education system. So that is from de public designated awarding bodies and those private providers with ambitions to become awarding bodies by virtue of delegated authority from PQI to make awards. So in total, there were 16 AQRs submitted by public higher education institutions and six submitted by private higher education institutions in addition to which, nine other private providers also submitted case studies. And it's important to know that they were not obliged to submit those case studies, but chose to do so to reflect and highlight the really important work that's happening right across the sector. So in terms of the report itself and the structure, chapter one is a succinct, high-level, system-level analysis informed by all of the AQRs. Uh, chapter two is a thematic analysis of those 16 public AQRs, and chapter three is an analysis of the six private um, provider uh, AQRs and those additional um, case studies that I mentioned. Okay, so each year, in addition to the standard headings in the AQR under which providers must report, QQI identifies a number of additional specific themes which providers are invited um, to address. And so for this particular reporting period, there were four. So those were ensuring the quality assurance and enhancement of work placements, um, an examination of the lessons learned and challenges ahead. And of course, that reflects the particular difficulties faced by both providers, learners, and even PSRBs um, during the lockdowns that we experienced during the pandemic. The second was enhancing student engagement in partnership with postgraduate research students. Uh, the third was the QA of research or research assessment, barriers to effective partnership. And the fourth one was ensuring that internal quality assurance can effectively facilitate and support access, mobility, and progression of refugees and asylum seekers. And of course, the situation uh, in Ukraine had kicked off about halfway through this reporting period and was reflected in a number of the AQRs submitted. So these themes were reflected in much more depth in the case studies that were submitted than in the body of the AQR reports themselves. And as we're going to be hearing directly from a number of you um, about case studies around these themes, we're not going to replicate the discussion back here. Okay. Um, so this morning we're really focusing our remarks on chapter one of the report, which is that system level analysis. 
Um, and we're in a very changing system at the moment, um, but what we can see is that we have still seven universities, but five technological universities, two remaining IOTs, and more than 20 private or independent providers, so I think that's a movable feast. Um, we are traditionally used to seeing analysis and in QQI insights being published on these sectors quite distinctly, so the public and private reported separately. So it's really interesting to be part of a system level analysis for this year. Um, one of the things that we found most interesting, and I would encourage you to dig into the report to read a little bit more about it, um, is the kind of convergence on some of the areas between the private or independent HEIs and what's probably traditionally been the domain of the public sector. So we can see some of our larger private higher education institutions um, achieving a Venus One Bronze Award, uh, developing Springboard Plus programs and delivering multiple iterations of those, and also developing apprenticeship programs and furthering the Apprenticeship Action Plan. So it is really interesting to see those dynamics change. Um, and I think there's more analysis in the report that we won't be able to cover this morning. Um, what we did also notice was that perhaps because the templates for reporting are either similar or the same for both the public and the private uh, higher education institutions, is that when we look through the lens of quality assurance, the, those differences in role, in profile, in mission of the institutions tend to be de-emphasised. And that's probably quite reassuring, because it would indicate that the quality assurance guidelines, our statutory quality assurance guidelines, are being kind of implemented with some level of consistency right across the sector. Um, it also is very kind of, I suppose, aligned with today's activity, because what that sort of suggested to us is that there's a huge amount of opportunity here for peer learning. It is lovely to see everybody here this morning from those different sectors, and I think as you progress into the parallel sessions and hearing about the case studies, you will realise, if you don't already, that there's plenty of peer learning that can be leveraged across these sectors. So colleagues in the private and in the public sectors are submitting case studies and reporting on quality assurance and quality enhancement activities they're actually very, very closely aligned. So it's really great to see QQI facilitating, um, actively facilitating that opportunity for peer learning this morning. Um, in terms of the system level analysis, one of the areas that stood out to us um, as a huge area of commonality in the way that it was reported on was related to COVID-19. So let's remember that we're going back in time. So COVID-19, it's not over yet, but it wasn't, it really wasn't over during this period of time. Um, there was actually surprisingly little emphasis on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in the reports submitted to cover this period. We were at first surprised by that. Some institutions, particularly in the private sector, reported on the sort of phased return to campus. Um, some institutions reported on the ongoing integration of online learning to their practice. But overall, there wasn't a lot of reflection on what COVID-19 will mean for us in the longer term. We also saw, and this was a continuity from the previous year's AQRs, that there was a lot of focus on information management system development, on data management, on harnessing our data, on cyber security. This was also reported for this year. But I suppose one of the things that we found difficult to discern in the analysis was the extent to which that was sort of, uh, let's say, fragmented or reactive activity in different areas of institutions versus the extent to which this was part of sort of strategic digital transformation agendas. So the, the degree to which that was reactive or strategic, we couldn't discern within the reporting. At the conclusion of that section of the analysis, what we've suggested and what we really strongly feel is that it was just too early for us to really meaningfully reflect at this stage on the lingering impacts of COVID-19. So in addition to the widespread transformations and innovations that were introduced on foot of the response measures introduced to COVID-19, this was also a period of quite significant change for a number of the reporting institutions. So in this period, we saw the establishment of three new technological universities, um, we had Technological University of the Shannon, um, Atlantic Technological University, and Southeast Technological University. And of course, we had two others established right before this period also. 
So the AQR is submitted by these um, by the technological university sector, ex as one might expect, reflect the really significant and transformative change taking place in terms of QA systems, governance structures, etc. They also report on the interim measures that have been put in place and the steps that have already been taken towards the introduction and establishment of new and integrated um, quality assurance systems and governance structures. Within the private provider reports that we saw, um, a significant theme emerging was around ambitions towards increased autonomy um, that we mentioned earlier. Um, so one provider, for example, expressed ambitions towards attainment of devolved responsibility for aspects of the program validation process, whilst three providers that had already attained that status indicated that they were in the process of preparing applications for QQI um, for delegation of authority to make awards. And this would seem to indicate a growing maturity and confidence in that sector, and perhaps increased trust on the part of the regulator in those more mature established private providers. So in terms of other notable trends um, emerging from right across the AQRs that submitted was um, a continued international focus um, expressed by institutions right across the board. So providers described collaborative um, provision with European and other international partners, um, articulation arrangements for student mobility, uh, membership of various European um, consortia and participation in a really wide range of international projects and activities. And in support of that internationalization agenda, um, some HEIs reported on new organizational structures, uh, new operational units, and the appointment of dedicated staff in this area. So for example, international officers and so on. Um, a number of the public institutions and one of the private providers also reported on engagement in program delivery on overseas campuses, either as solo ventures or in partnership with local institutions. However, there is less detail provided in general on those activities or on the services and supports in place to underpin that provision or on the quality assurance of that provision and the awards to which it leads. And that's an area that might um, be more usefully covered in, in greater depth in future reporting periods. I have the pleasure of talking about emerging strengths. Um, so there are two areas that really came across very prominently in this year's AQRs, and I think that you know, they deserve to be called out strongly. The first of these was equality, diversity, and inclusion initiatives within our higher education institutions, and the other was the implementation of the sustainable development goals. And I think this is particularly interesting because at the moment, these are not features of our quality assurance regulatory context in Ireland, and yet our institutions have shown real leadership here. Um, so in terms of equality, diversity and inclusion, many of you are fully aware that our public sector institutions are obliged to engage with the Athena Swan process. But I think we really need to emphasize that the AQRs make clear that this is not a compliance activity. There is a lot of bottom-up groundswell of support, and that's not surprising given the wider shifts in society. But that tells us that in the future, our students are going to be learning in institutions where things like gender identity and active consent and anti-racism initiatives are kind of normalized within the culture. And that should be very reassuring, I think, to all of us. Um, the other area that came across really strongly was achievement on the SDGs. And I've just got a yellow card. I don't know how we're not in three minutes. Um, so, um, so our public sector institutions have done very well in terms of rankings, but there are also very concrete reports on sustainable campus environments, green initiatives, um, kind of you know low carbon footprints, etc. Perhaps most important of all, though, we are seeing indicators that already sustainability is being integrated into the curriculum, and those institutions that haven't done that yet are reporting that this is within their strategic plan for the years ahead. So that tells us that Irish students are going to be graduating in the years ahead, having really engaged meaningfully with the concepts and principles of sustainability in their discipline and bringing that knowledge out into industry and workforce, which again is very valuable for all of us. So a bit of a pat on the back for everyone on that one. <laughs> so in terms of teaching, learning and assessment, which for me is the core of what we do and I hope for everybody else as well, um, just to point out that Universal Design for Learning, or UDL, 
remains and continually um, is reported as the kind of primary conceptual framework that's informing development in this area. So we're seeing that focus on inclusive practice, extending EDI into the learner experience. We would say that it was difficult to discern whether this was you know, isolated incidences of champions within faculties who are promoting UDL, um, or whether there are sort of plans to integrate this into strategic institution-wide initiatives. So we would hope that in the years ahead we can see that sort of in, you know, reported at a more strategic institution-wide level. There are a few institutions that make this clear in the annual quality reports. Um, in other instances we have case studies, but we're not entirely sure how uh, widespread that is in the institution. Um, other strong themes, and I think this comes across in the case study program presentations that we'll see later today, are around employability and industry-led teaching, and the very, very important role that career services are beginning to play in augmenting learning and teaching in that area. Um, we also saw a focus, not surprisingly, on online learning and blended learning and continued efforts to integrate that more meaningfully into our modes of delivery as opposed to as a reactive emergency measure. Um, finally, rethinking assessment. Um, so we saw a focus on authenticity, particularly, particularly in the technological university and the private sector institutions. Authenticity and assessment came across very strongly as a theme of well, current times and the future. Um, authenticity and assessment leads me very nicely into Academic integrity, Deirdre. I'll move over for this one. Sure. Um, okay, so I'm going to fly now because Deirdre must be close. So, in addition to that increased focus on assessment design that Kathy has mentioned, uh, this year's AQR is expressed to continue to focus on the integrity of assessment. So, the expansion and the mainstreaming of academic integrity as a focus across Irish higher education was reflected in the sheer number um, and scale and range of initiatives that were reported on. And, and I, I think the forefront within all of those were guidance materials, resources, tools, etc., that were developed um, to support learners, but also staff. And so within that, we saw use of, for example, the FGA module and academic um, integrity, which I think almost universally reported on across the technological sector, both um, TUs and IOTs. Um, there was universal, I think, reporting on the activities of the National Academic Integrity Network, the name, um, and the significant role that it plays um, in, in kind of spearheading and leading discussions in this area in the sector. Conversely, and interestingly, what we didn't see, I think maybe one or two exceptions, was discussion of how the, the suite of documents that were produced by the name at the start of this reporting period, so the guidelines on academic integrity, there was principles, um, a lexicon of common terms, we didn't hear about whether or how that suite of documentation had been adopted and or implemented by institutions. So it would be really interesting to see in future reporting periods the impact um, of that suite of documentation. Uh, <clears throat> we also didn't hear about the, we're, we're done, okay, so look, I'll wrap it up there, you'll hear lots about academic integrity I'm sure later in the day, um, but so that was a snapshot of the, the range of themes and trends that emerged throughout um, the report, but we do all encourage you to download a copy and, and have a read of it yourself.